last night, which was really quite a show. Uh, all right, here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to look at the minutes, the treasurer's report. Uh, I have a little PowerPoint on what we do as a board and what we're currently working on. Uh, Cindy is going to talk about water testing. Um, Deb, you somewhere, is going to talk about planning zoning cases and maybe what we as citizens can do about those. Uh, then we'll get to uh, an update on incorporation and then announcements would be any, anywhere that you want to go, anything you want to announce, and of course questions as we go along. Um, we're going to have a question box at the end where we're going to um, invite you to put in your questions and comments if you'd like to do so anonymously or if you'd like to sign your name, that's fine too. Uh, but that way we figure we'll get more thoughts from the people who show up right here, which is so important to us. Okay, anything else uh, that I need to add to the agenda that you don't see there? All right, so we're going to take a quick look at the minutes of the last meeting. Not that one. Not, not poop, I hope. <laughs> All right, so uh, I hope that you've had a chance to take a look at these online. Our minutes are always online at our uh, gpica.org um, and so we uh, let's see what did we do <laughs> well we looked at the, um, the wonderful photo from Martha Heward who, uh, who just won the first prize in a, a very important contest uh, for another piece uh, she's incredible. And then that um, was raffled off at, at Mango Mania. Um, Cindy then talked about some things about voting, which just moved out really quickly. <coughs> um, then we looked at the minutes, we looked at our uh, finances, which are going to be very similar to what we see tonight. Um, and then Mikes Makakis talk to us. Uh, he's the general manager of the Great Island Water Association. He talked to us about the annexation issues and where we were on those. Um, and then, then he showed yeah, some of these uh, maps which uh, Nadine has helpfully put into the minutes. So you can see them along with other uh, websites that she's put in um, as you're reading uh, through them at your leisure. Uh, Mikas told you about um, uh, how a small group of us went to see our representatives Adam Botana and Mike Giolombardo as well as Senator Ray Rodriguez about the annexation issues and a little bit about what we uh, learned from them and what we expected might come out of those visits. And then um, he encouraged uh, people to write letters to the representatives and we mentioned that uh, when we went into Seattle Botana, he had a whole stack of envelopes right there on his desk that he said came from us and he said what it was that that was really uh, uh, something that made him sit up and take notice. So I don't know if he was, you know, like what was behind that, but I, I was uh, thinking, good, you know, a lot of people wrote letters. They got those letters and they thought they were important. Um, so your activism really does make a difference. Then, <clears throat> become incorporated, why it takes years in order to go through the process, why it's so expensive, um, and that PowerPoint uh, presentation is on our website. And then uh, we talked a little bit about 
why the last incorporation effort stalled at a certain point and um, why we're kind of thinking about um, moving forward on it again, kind of with a certain amount of trepidation. So, uh, continue down the line here. Oh. <laughs> we got a few things in here. Uh, does anybody remember who won the 50-50 raffle ticket last time? It was a, nobody here was the person who won it. Okay, we, we'll get her name at another time. <clears throat> and then uh, we adjourned the meeting. So that was the minutes of the last meeting. And I would appreciate a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Okay. Uh, second. Okay, two seconds it. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, all against approving the minutes. Thank you. All right, minutes have been approved. <coughs> Let's go now to the a quick glance at the treasurer's report. Our treasurer is in Ireland right now, going home to Ireland. So. <coughs> Here is our, uh, what we've got, and as usual, it's, uh, it looks like a lot of money, but you know how fast money can be spent. So we did get um, $735 in in membership dues, which is wonderful, and spent a little bit on postage and copies, uh, but that is basically our treasury. So, uh, motion to approve the treasurer's report. Motion to approve the treasurer's report. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, is there a second? Thank you, Jeff. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Anybody opposed? All right, the treasurer's report has been approved. Okay. I wanted to tell you about the memberships. Uh, we now have 242 paid members up to date. And on our email list, that is people who ask to sign up to be on our email list, we have 967 people on that list, which I think is fabulous. And it's because of Nadine, Nadine's work, yay. <laughs> But we are so organized now in this way. So thank you so much for that. Um, if you're not yet a member, uh, you can join after the meeting by going to see Nadine uh, right at the door, or you can join online at uh, gpica.org. Uh, and it's inexpensive, $15 for the entire year. All right. So now I'm going to go on to, yeah, to what, who we are and what we do. Yeah. So here, this is what we're working on. And I chose this background because it really spoke to me about the way that all the issues that we work on are interlocking. Um, each one of them not only affects the one that's next to it, that's most similar to it, but also if it's taken out or jiggled or something, the whole structure is affected. So the, the issues of development, water quality, uh, traffic, all these issues that we're all concerned about here on the island uh, are not easy. Let's move on to the next one. So here are our current issues. Um, so water quality and the environment, we have a short update on that for you tonight. Uh, for development track of old orders that may not still be subject to current now to go on and on for years, even over 20 years, without actually um, uh, developing anything on those properties, but they could, uh, and all of a sudden we didn't want to be surprised, so we're researching all of those old development orders, and 
We're also keeping track of the new orders, the requests for zoning changes, the requests for variances, and other ways to bend the rules of development, which is done on a regular basis. So in order to do that, um, uh, board members are attending meetings, not only of what's happening on Greater Pine Island, but also on contiguous areas, uh, such as the development along Bird Store Road, which is a new uh, thing that they're really talking up in Cape Coral. Um, what kind of businesses they're going to have along that corridor, how that's going to increase traffic, uh, and uh, potentially affect us here on the island. So then roads, the roads including this proposed new bike path, um, uh, board members are attending the bike path meetings. We are requesting road repair uh, when it comes up. Um, traffic mitigation, the winter season, of course, will be coming sooner than we know. Uh, and uh, again, people are going to start complaining about traffic. We have um, mentioned a number of times to Commissioner Kevin Ruane that a right hand, the extension of the right hand lane at the corner of Pine Island Road and Veterans would ease traffic somewhat by allowing especially the trucks not to be going off the edges of the road and crumbling the roadway and uh, uh, being dangerous to other cars, but let's have a regular long uh, uh, right-hand turn lane there. Um, on the new residents, uh, we've been keeping track of new home sales and contacting residents with information about the GPICA and urging them to become members and get involved. Um, as far as outreach goes, we're reaching out to other communities besides those in Greater Pine Island, as trying to establish cordial relations, looking for ways to cooperate and coordinate the things we do with the same issues, usually the same kinds of issues that they're faced with. Then the annexation uh, defense, we're attending meetings of uh, the Annexation Defense Committee that's been meeting weekly, headed by Mikes Malakakis of the Water Board, talking to legislators, as I mentioned, about, um, about um, annexation. And finally, the uh, incorporation process, for which we'll have uh, a brief update tonight. So, I'm going to go to the next slide. So in summary, here are the kinds of things that we do. <laughs> Meet with public officials. We hold public information sessions. We try to be the go-to place for developers that are requesting variances, zoning changes, all kinds of things. The first, their first step is a public information meeting. So we try to make it with us so that the more people from the community know about it and can comment on it. We attend and we speak at public meetings. We educate ourselves and others. We design and carry out research, and this is especially about the old development orders. We do community service projects, like picking up trash on the roadway, recruit new members, and reach out to other groups and individuals doing similar work. So, how you can get involved. Um, you can help with a specific project. You can join a GPICA committee. If you have professional advice um, that will be useful to us, we would love it if you would offer that advice. You can help us recruit new members. You can apply to join our board. We have three uh, seats right now that are vacant. Um, so, if you want to do any of those things, uh, we really welcome your further participation. So write to us at info at gpica.org or talk to me, Nadine, or any of the other board members here uh, after the meeting. Okay, so 
Now we're going to go to a presentation by Cindy about water quality. And, um, okay? Yeah, you already got a preview of that slide, darn it. Took away some of my punch. Um, so to talk about water quality and water quality monitoring would take us a semester. So literally I want to be clear that I'm going to focus on a specific type of water quality parameter and a specific water quality test and some results that have come from our own little island here and what it uh, might mean, does mean, could mean, what we might want to do about it. Um, so, to start, let me see, I'm always clicking this for Helen, I'm clicking for myself. So, this weekend I got to visit my little granddaughter, <laughs> my, my husband and I, right? I got to go see um, her, adorable, right? Um, she is almost two now. She enjoys getting into the bathtub along with her mother and, you know, playing with the bubbles and washing her hair and sometimes... You can maybe, some people are knowing where I'm going with this already, right? Sometimes she poops in the tub, in the water, which causes a great fuss because why? Why is it not good? Yeah, it poops in the water. There's bacteria, and bacteria, they could then get into the wrong places, right? So... We know that um, everybody poops, and in our current systems, we, we poop into the water all the time. We flush it with our toilets, right? <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of us, too, and, you know, everybody poops, too. It's not just us. It's all the other living things here around us that are pooping, and there's more of it, so we have to be more cautious about what gets into the water. It's not good. There might be microbiologists here in the audience. There might be uh, sewer professionals here in the audience who could go into more more detail than me. But um, for the purposes of tonight, you, you kind of get where we're going here. Right? So then um, we are all a little bit more versed to these days, I think, about the fact that in our biological systems, there's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria. I ate breakfast this morning, and I ate a cashew milk yogurt, and I ate a bunch of live bacteria. Because those bacteria are the good guys. But I've got some bad guys in there, too. And so the good guys help keep the bad guys, in, you know, in balance. And so we're all aware that our guts are full of a stew of all kinds of organisms, and we excrete it periodically. <laughs> okay? So, um, the thing is, included in our guts, and the guts of all warm-blooded animals are a group of bacteria known as the fecal coliform. Anybody heard of this group of bacteria before? Okay, a few people have. Okay, so, um, we excrete undigested material along with it for all these groups of bacteria, lots of different kinds. And in the fecal coliform um, groups are um, ones that help us digest, and they're not necessarily in and of themselves pathogenic or cause diseases. Most of them don't. E. coli is sort of the is the exception. It can cause a bad, you know, gastroenteritis. You don't want E. coli in the wrong place. But the thing is. Fecal coliform hang out with other bad bacteria. And the other bad bacteria can be ones that cause cholera, typhus, hepatitis, and other bad human diseases. There are ecological concerns about these types of bacteria as well. If we just concentrate on the human health issue, though, I think we're all pretty um, clear that some bacteria can generally be you know, pretty bad. Any questions so far? Okay, this is Everybody Poops 101. All right, so here on Pine Island then, we're almost hopefully pooping into toilets. All right, okay, 
And um, here's a fun fact for you. I'm sure you wanted to know this. An average man poops about a pound per day. How do you know that? Um, and um, if you want to know about the liquid waste for an average man, it's about half a gallon. Um, so, yeah, your husband's above average, but he said over there. Ladies, let's be nice. <laughs> okay, and so now, depending on where you are pooping on Pine Island into a toilet, uh, um, it's either going to, people are going, oh my gosh, uh, this is important, but trust me, um, some of you uh, will be going into a septic tank. You know, plus the toilet, it's going to go magically away. No, <laughs> it goes possibly into a septic tank. Other places on the island, when you flush, it might go out the pipes into a small package treatment plant. Sort of a mini sewage treatment plant. And other places on our islands here, we actually have central sewer system. I live right back here. If I, yes, I poop too. Okay, if I poop at home, it goes into a septic tank. If I go to the Publix, it goes into the sewer. So we have a kind of a mixed situation out here on Pine Island. And um, the septic tanks are really pretty simple. It literally is a tank. Anybody here work with septic systems? Yay, okay, you could probably explain it better than me, but, but basically it's designed uh, and to make heavy stuff fall to the bottom, light oily particles from your wastewater go up to the top, so you have what happens on the bottom, you get a sludge layer, and they call it the scum layer on top, and then there's this sort of water layer in between, and that water layer leaches out, and it goes into your drain field area, which basically is where it seeps into the soils and gets uptaken by the plants. Now, if your sludge and your scum get too thick each, then you start to have more of the, or less area for the water and more of the scum can go out and more of the particles can go out and there's less time that any decomposition is breaking down in there. And those bacteria in there are in the dark and there's other bacteria in there. So ostensibly they're getting broken down into cleaner, less complex organisms. <laughs> but if the system's not working right, if there's a leak in between somewhere, then, <laughs> then, right, the poop is in it, just go out and in your yard and magically disappear. We have in Florida and on this island, you know, water seeping underground, moving, flowing towards the lowest spots, the estuaries, etc. Um, and literally, you should pump your septic tank a lot. I hear five years, I hear three years, two. I, yeah, that's, um, well, of course, it depends on how many people are in your house and how big your system is, but every two to three years, right? So, um, <laughs> did anybody check on that for you? Anybody call you up and say, hey, what's the last time you, you pumped this up to the name? Maybe you get some coupons in the mail that says, oh, it's going to be cheaper if I do it now, but... There is no regulatory oversight to be sure that we're doing it well. And we all need that. I mean, gosh, we'll go, you know, speeding down the road if somebody doesn't tell us the speed limit. <laughs> you know, we're, we're fallible, we're human. And if your system's um, not been inspected lately either, then okay. So we all play a part. We all play a part in this. Um, and then, of course, I did tell you that uh, we all poop. It's not just people. So then there's the... Thing about, I don't want to dance, which I point out. Oh, I got to push the right button. There we go. All right, yes, pet waste really does make a difference. All right, so uh, if you pick up your pet's waste and you put it in a bag and throw it in the trash, where does it go? Incinerator. Yeah, okay, I heard both landfill and incinerator. Yeah, our municipal waste is no longer handled in a landfill. The county has a waste to energy facility. So it would go and it would get burned. So that sounds pretty good, right? Get rid of all the bacteria. They do have pretty good pollution control equipment. 
on that stack. Yeah, it gets burned up and goes into the air, some of it, but there's capture mechanisms up, up there. So, um, so pets are, they literally are a concern um, for uh, our water quality around here. And then, uh, you know, right here on, on Pine Island, we do have some of these kinds of animals that don't use a toilet. <laughs> and, uh, and bird waste is a little bit different. And of course, it's not usually as concentrated unless they're in an, a rookery. And when there were fewer of us humans, that was the case too. It was just, you know, it's concentrated and it was a, a little bit of a different issue. And then of course, there's some of these on the island too. And just in case you were wondering, another fun fact, an average adult cow poops 60 to 85 pounds in a day. So you thought your husband was tough. <laughs> That's right. So, and they're not using toilets either. Um, and of course, in some places, there are big regulatory programs and plans for um, waste on the ground from large animal agriculture. But in some places, it's just on the ground. It's full of what of it. So these are all opportunities to see that there are interlocking pieces that can come together to help us all think about and improve uh, water quality. So why did this come up for this meeting? Well, it came up for this meeting because just recently, Calusa Waterkeeper, a nonprofit organization dedicated to water quality through science and through information, they expanded their testing locations for fecal coliform bacteria. Now, they, remember I said, well, the fecal coliform themselves are not necessarily pathogenic, but they are indicator species. You saw it up there. They're indicator species for the presence of other pathogenic organisms. And they're, and they're Therefore, indicators for presence of poop in the water. You just want to get down to the basics. And we're talking human health. We haven't gone into the ecological impacts and how that might tie to other things you're all concerned about. Algal blooms, red tide, etc. So they added a new site. And when they tested here in July, here's Flamingo Bay on Pine Island. The unit is called MPN. It's because it's it stands for the most probable number per 100 milliliters of water. Now, it's a standard unit that's been used for water quality monitoring, scientifically validated everywhere. It's how standards are set for drinking water, for water where you can harvest shellfish from, and where you can um, swim or recreate. Uh, so that was quite a troubling number. It is way off the charts for any of the standards. Um, and um, here on Matt with Shade Pine Island, I know it's a little blurry. Um, I'm going to show you how you can access these records yourself. But here's um, the Matt Lachey boat ramp was in an okay region uh, for numbers. Now these numbers can be ephemeral. They can change. There definitely are variables out there. But what that means is if you live near or around Flamingo Bay, you're going to launch your boat there, or your dog's going to swim there, or you want to catch fish there, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Um, and I'll show you to the May. It was not testing in June. Um, but let me back up and say, you know, we are in a position on Pine Island where we are downstream from everything else. That doesn't mean we can't do our best possible work here on our own island as a role model for others or for the inputs that we have into the waters surrounding us. But obviously we're down, oh, let me back that up because I want to choose the point. We're downstream. And we're downstream from yes, Lake Okeechobee and everywhere, <laughs> other things. So lots of interlocking parts. People working on all those parts. We can work here on our island. So there was not testing done in June, 
But if you look back at May even, and they don't quite line up because of an extra testing site here in July, but here was um, Flamingo Bay then. So there was a, a precursor to this way off the charts number. Um, there um, are opportunities to do better, or not better, to do more testing, better is not the right word at all, forgive that, to do more detailed testing or to do additional testing, but it all is costly and it all involves um, the, uh, involvement of trained uh, folks. And so I just want to show you too a little more, so where was this happening? This is the sample point. Um, Sue, who is the Calusa Waterkeeper uh, person who did the monitoring is here with us tonight too. She could tell you more if you are interested. And then, um, where is this on the island then? So, so can y'all locate where it is? You know the island well enough? So we'd be up here. And this would be if you're heading down towards St. James City. Down there. Here's the sample point. Here are a number of older residences. Many potentially have septic systems that are in need. Um, and then also the right here is um, this cattle operation. And this is not to point fingers anybody anyway, um, but there's a problem in the water right there right now. And it's something we need to be aware of and keep our eye on. And, um, you know, in the meantime, uh, as we get more samples and we learn more and we think about how we can help and what we can do to alleviate this situation, do be careful yourself. Do check on the water quality parameters before you are in the water. I wish we could all just go swimming anywhere, anytime, <laughs> do anything, you know, but it's not that case anymore. Um, and I want to show you too, so we have some other things. This is what the Calusa Waterkeepers website looks like. When you go to their website, and you go under water and air testing, that's where you find all the results. There are also great little films to watch, things to learn, ways to give money so they could give, do more testing. I'd like to also uh, point you to the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, which is right on the other side of Pine Island Sound from us. Um, their water quality monitoring does extend all the way up to the Caloosahatchee and they were working with the Army Corps of Engineers on the releases and those issues. When you do a pull down under water quality, you can see you can get the Caloosahatchee condition reports. They're writing and sending those reports weekly to every official imaginable <laughs> and you can read well, what they're telling them and what they're recommending and lots of other resources for you too. And um, this water atlas, it's from Tampa Bay, but if you're now wanting to know more about what the actual you know, water quality parameters are and how to learn more, this Tampa Bay water atlas is very helpful also. Now, one thing we are discussing as a board here at the Greater Pine Island Civic Association is working on and developing a community playbook for healthy waterways. There is a template that's already been created by the Gulf Coast Community Foundation in Sarasota. It takes all these various opportunities and concerns and puts it together into actionable items that Ban the engineering to the education and it, because the template exists and a lot of data is out there, um, it, it can be a great way to have some action moving forward because I think some of us go, well, haven't they studied this a lot? What do we do now? Um, and in the meantime, 
for yourself for now. Of course, I said, you know, if you got a septic system and you can afford it, you know, take care of it now. Um, if you've got pets, clean up after them. If you can plant native plants, bioremediation is a great thing to act as buffers between the land and, and shoreline. And I'm sure all of you probably also have some ideas on how we can help improve things. So. Any questions then for me or for Sue? Cindy, can you give her the mic so the people? Yes. Um, I was just saying I'm kayak a lot, so I'm going through a lot of the canals and so on. And I see like every once in a while like pipes coming out from people's houses. I don't know if they're connected to anything, but I mean it seems like they might be a little bit concerning. Has anybody looked at that to see what some of these pipes might be connected to? Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. You know, that would be the kind of thing you could start kind of keeping track of. If I should have said, if anybody wants to join me in taking um, on this community playbook, that would be the kind of information we, that gets included in a playbook. It says there's this, it could mean this, what can we do about it? Those are probably the others. They, yeah, they're, right. they could be storm drain runoff, so it could be just rainwater. Um, but it could be something else. I you know there are some older places here that may or may not have connected correctly. So one of the things that the, I'm, I'm a member of Calusa Waterkeeper and, and a ranger. Um, one of the things we recommend is take a couple of pictures, mark it, um, either mark it on a map, you can put a pin on you, you know, if you have a cell phone, you can drop a, a, a pin in that location, it's a little, you know, push the your thumb on it, it'll, it'll drop a pin. Um, so we can get a location because it's helpful to have the exact location, especially out on the water. And then send it in to Calusa Waterkeeper and say, hey, I'm curious about this. Uh, you know, does anybody know if this is, if this is okay? Uh, we've, been, we've been encouraging kayakers to do that, to, to, especially if it smells funny. Um, there have been places where people say, I go out and kayak and it really smells horrible here and there's a pipe coming up. So, yeah, we want to catch that and investigate it. Yeah. Thank you. Any? Oh, that, that way I see Frank has a question. Hi, I'm Frank Potter. I'm on the board for the Water Authority. I just want to mention our water is really good. Plus, every year we put out a water quality report. So you can go to the water company website and pull down the water quality and they show where we get our water from, which is like four to 500 feet below the surface. So it's in a series of aquifers, it's pretty deep down. So we don't get any of the surface water. So I just wanted to make people feel comfortable and give them a source of information. I am really glad Frank did that because that's true. We don't get our drinking water from a reservoir that's sitting on the top of the surface getting any of this kind of problems. We've got these aquifers, we've got the water quality standards, our sewage treatment plant does a great job here as well. The drinking water issue is separate from this, so thank you Frank. This is why we have a whole organization. probably small in comparison to the possible septic system bleaching of the water, but is there any way they monitor the people that are living on the boats and where the waste is going? Because there's quite a few people living on sailboats up and down my canal, and I don't see bathrooms out there, and I don't see anybody coming to pump sewage out of their boats. So is there any way that monitors that? Ostensibly, yes, but... Well, I... Not I keep really. answering for where I, I used to live, and when I remember I'm in Florida, <clears throat> where the rules are a little different. Um, <clears throat> there should be. Uh, they should be uh, self-contained, but I don't know who monitors and regulates that. It's a good question. Facilities up and down the world, and people are leasing or renting their space and channel out to sailboats. 
That's a really good question. I'm going to follow up on that because um, it should be monitored. It should be just like a uh, an RV where you have a self-contained system and it gets pumped. And you would, you know, if you have an RV in an RV park, they're pumping stations. But um, sailboats are supposed to follow those rules. What I don't know is what Florida enforcement is. Right, and enforcement gets to be tricky, as we've talked about. So there was a question back here too. My name is Warren Sherado. I work with Sue and the Waterkeepers, and I'm also a member of uh, another group, and that's the Right to Clean Water. So we get two organizations represented here tonight. Um, the, as far as the sailboat goes, each community has its own enforcement policies. And so it can uh, occur through the local police department where they would go out, uh, and as far as the water surface um, police goes, the, 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 pe the people that go out and actually patrol for water violations, they can uh, stop a sailboat and ask if they've been pumping or where they've been pumping. Um, all the way to the Department of Agriculture. So it's, it's a myriad of different law enforcement agencies that can stop a person that's got a sailboat and uh, ask them about pumping. Um, as far as the uh, uh, right to clean water, I can talk about that a little bit later on, but um, that's coming from a different, entirely different perspective of helping out with water. Uh, and Cindy, I'll let you go ahead and run a little bit further. Um, I've got some apps on my uh, cell phone that you can uh, pull down yourself here. They all occur on both um, the Android as well as the uh, uh, iPhone. And uh, let me tell you about a couple of them. Um, there is the uh, Florida Water uh, Reporter, and uh, that you can go ahead and, and actually submit uh, uh, actual uh, reports of uh, blue green algae or um, something that looks fine, fish uh, kills. Uh, algae kills. Uh, there's Bloom Watch that you can pull up and report again algae kills. Um, and then there's Algae Scum ID. And that's more like a, a West Coast, right? as in a U.S. West Coast. Uh, but it's kind of like, uh, it, it does some stuff that we would like to have it do, but it doesn't recognize the creatures that we have around here. So there's a bunch of apps. If you just go to your app store, uh, you can pull down uh, various different apps. Uh, and then there's always a, a good old department of um, uh, the DP, uh, DEP, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And you can report to them uh, sightings of real bad blue-green algae breakouts or uh, uh, fish kills. So uh, that's just a few things that can be done. All right, so some apps. Some apps for identifying scum, for water reporting, right to clean water, and these things will be recorded in our minutes on our Facebook page. And later when we have time, when you're, we're going to ask you for your comments or questions. If you didn't get any of that and you want to know more, I think we're also going to, at future board meetings, do more about what did these tests, what do they mean, what are our results, so that we have a clearinghouse to be sharing that. Other questions? Because we've got we other to, good stuff. Deb's going to talk to us about rezoning, and of course, that all links to water quality, too. So thank you, guys. Okay, thank you very much, Cindy. Go ahead, Deb. give you the incorporation update first before she talks about the rezoning issues. So um, as some of you may know, I wrote a letter uh, to the Eagle, um, which was published in the Eagle last week about incorporation, the whole idea of why uh, this issue has come up again and what we're thinking about doing about it. That letter is also on our website and it was sent out to our big uh, list of email subscribers. Um, just to summarize that letter a little bit, uh, I talked about the, the fact that there is a renewed interest in incorporation. 
uh, by folks like you who've come to these meetings. And uh, at one of our meetings, 50 of you out of about 70 raised their hands when somebody asked, uh, are you in favor of incorporation? And, um, so we're all alarmed by the latest annexations by Cape Coral, the proposed development on, on uh, Bird Store, uh, all of that Bird Store new, new stuff that's coming up as well as a development on an annex, a voluntarily annexed property at the corner of Veterans and Pine Island Road. Um, you know, and we've all had concerns that the county may be more interested in high density development than they are in preservation of the environment or improvement of our way of life uh, that we enjoy here on Pine Island. However, as we all know, I think incorporation is a lengthy process. It takes a lot of people power to get going. It takes people who are really willing uh, to get out there and do an awful lot of work, and it's very expensive. We would need a new feasibility study to replace the one that was done par partially done uh, several uh, years ago because the finances of our country and our region have changed, and also that feasibility study was never completed. Um, so we need to find new consultants if we're going to go ahead with this. Uh, to do a new feasibility study and then to look at the, at the proposed charter for uh, the new town and to say, well, what, uh, what parts of Greater Pine Island really want to incorporate and r write that into the charter and make the charter amenable to what people really want. Um, and then we have to get the cooperation of our legislators. <laughs> Uh, which is not always an easy thing uh, to even put the question um, on the ballot. And once the question of incorporation, this is after a straw vote where we have to prove that, yeah, there's enough interest in incorporation, that legislators, we're ready to move forward on this. That would require one vote. And then the second vote would be when we finally, all of these things would have been done, a whole lot of money would have been spent, the legislators would be on our side, and then the legislators would be able to put the question of incorporation on a ballot, on a, and it, at a, an election, a, a regular election. And that's when the citizens of Pine and the property owners, and the, the people who live here and are voters, not necessarily property owners, the voters on Greater Pine choose, get to choose yes or no on incorporation. And we wouldn't want to go through all of that and then have people say no. But that's happened to other communities. So we, we had a special board meeting last week to talk about, well, what's next? Do we do an education campaign? Do we, uh, do we uh, go and get a consultant uh, and ask that consultant how much it would cost to do a feasibility study and what that would look like? Um, and we were advised, uh, wait a minute, we're moving a little, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We're moving a little too fast. Um, we found out that there is a group called the Florida League of Cities, which I didn't know about. The Florida League of Cities helps groups like us, communities like us, decide whether or not they want to incorporate. That's not all they do, but that's one of the things they do. They have consultants who would come and speak to us at the board, presumably for without a fee, and they would be able to tell us things like um, the what what the thing might what the feasibility study might cost, the likely outcome for a community like ours, which I think is really important to know, uh, the experiences of other you know, unincorporated areas, the pitfalls to look out for, and uh, ways to garner broad uh, community support. So 
that's our due diligence that we're going to do. We're going to have, we're going to contact a consultant to speak with the board about all of these things. And then, uh, if we decided to go ahead um, with the feasibility study, we would need to come back to you and say, are you ready to do this? And then we would probably put out a request for proposal, an RFP, if you're uh, um, into that language. A request for proposal, and that means we just put it out there and various consultants apply to us and they say, well, here's what, here's what we would do for your feasibility study and here's how much we would charge. And we would choose which consultant looks uh, they're going to give us the best step up. Oh, um, we also found out that uh, we have we would have two years to do this, and the reason we would have two years, and maybe uh, Nadine can help me. I don't see where Nadine is anymore. Yeah, maybe Dean, Nadine can remind me about this. But. Uh, <laughs> Why do we have two years? Because we missed a deadline uh, that just went by. And Nadine yeah. is getting a microphone. She'll tell us a little more about that. We would have to get it before the next legislative session. And to do that, it has to be um, on the legislative delegation's agenda before What's the date? September. It's a date in September, but there's just not enough time to do everything we would need to do for the legislators to say, the legislators to say, oh yes, clearly you have everybody's support, and yes, we will support you. So there's just not time to do it this year. Um, and the other thing we had talked about was getting on having a count, the county run a straw poll vote for us the way they did for Lehigh Acres a few years ago. Um, there's been a movement off and on uh, for a long time out there also to incorporate and the county actually sponsored a vote. It was a straw poll so it wasn't it wasn't the ultimate yes or no we're going to become a city uh, but it was a straw poll and um, the county paid for that um, but it has to take place during a general election. They're not gonna hold a special election for us to do that. And our next general election is two years from now. I yeah, think that's- Yeah, that was the two year cutoff. Yeah. Was getting that straw poll on the ballot. Um, one of the uh, things that was done the last time incorporation came up and the last time the GPICA tried to move forward was they tried to do their own straw poll and that was looked at, at by some people as biased. It was not fair because the GPICA, which at that time was very much pushing incorporation, was the one to write the questions and send out the postcards and count the ballots and all of that. And uh, so we figured the way to make sure that there is no bias at all is to have it come up at any an actual election, when you would go to the polls and and you would cast your vote that way. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about, and th this is where we are. Yes, um, we'll so yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Killen. Hi, Dave. Hi, I'm not an engineer, but I've worked a lot on the project. And they have a thing called a Gantt chart. And a Gantt chart leads, lists on one side all the things that have to be done. And they have a calendar going the other way. So something's going to take two weeks, and it's got to be done after two other things is put here. It's a very effective way to keep yourself on target for whatever the end point is. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've been uh, actually looking at some uh, planning software for another project for something totally different that I'm involved in. That planning self software does the same kind of thing. Um, it's a little more complex and we thought it was more than we needed. But yeah, to once, once the ball starts rolling, 
you know, and then you have to keep your dates, you have to decide, okay, we're going to do some community education. Who's going to do that? And where are they going to do that? And what's that going to involve? And how are we going to get everybody to tell the same story rather than everybody just, you know, making it up as they go along? Um, all of those things uh, would, would need to be planned. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I feel bowled over just, you know, just by thinking about the amount of work that is. But it can be done. It can be done. So many other communities have done this successfully. So, you know, if it's feasible, we too. Yeah, there's another question. <laughs> We all have a clear and concise plan with dates and we can get like something together as a group that we all have actionable items and dates that they need to be done so we can get this effort organized and moving forward because it's 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 right now i feel like it's it just this is just me coming in but it sounds a bit just like the plan is disjointed and i i if we have like clear dates and things that like he said like if we have something i'm all about planning yeah so yeah uh -huh. Fail, so. Yeah, you got to get organized. But before we get organized, we have to decide if we want to do it. And to decide if we want to do it at all, we have to know some of these background pieces of information. How much is it going to cost? Who would do the, the feasibility study? What is the likelihood of success? Which communities? in Greater Pine Island want to incorporate together and is that feasible? You know, that was one of our trip up things that happened last time because some people in Mount Lachey were very much against it. They didn't want to incorporate with us. But we needed Mount Lachey. So is there, are there other ways? What about the outer islands? Maybe the outer islands would incorporate with Pine Island if Mount Lachey didn't want to incorporate. Who knows? I mean, all of these questions would need to be explored before we get to the plan. But I absolutely agree. You've got to get, once you decide to move forward, you've got to get hyper-organized. Okay. You spoke last meeting about the stronghold and then who could vote in the election. Yeah. Is it possible to give yourself a date and say, okay, we have this influx of snowbirds coming back that can vote in this straw poll, so to speak, correct? They just well, can't vote uh, in that election to incorporate or not incorporate because they're not Florida residents. I think they have to be um, voters, Florida voters. In the straw poll? In the straw poll? If we ran the straw poll through the county elections office, yeah, you have to be a registered voter. Um, how, how we did it before was we sent postcards. We pulled the voter registration list from uh, the county, and we sent postcards to every registered voter in the, the area that we were talking about incorporating. Um, and, you know, whatever, you can look at our website and see what the numbers were at that time. But that went to everybody, but you still, again, it was for registered voters. Well, I, I don't know how we can get the snowbirds involved in this, but you've probably got a large population of the island that has no interest higher taxes, and more government in here. I mean, everybody kind of came here, I think, for the same reasons. Quiet, with very little government, with very little disruption in our life. So if you can get your information together, and they can help in any way, I think you're going to get a lot of positive input from the population that's only here a few months out of the year. So we keep talking. It's only a second meeting I've been to, and we've gone over a lot of the same items. But if, if this is an interesting fact. If you can get some information from them, I think you'll all be willing to come back and listen to it. There's, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of the same faces from last week here. So we can get a captive audience to come back once you have this information. I think you you put people's attention. Now we, or at least get a lot more people's attention. Okay, I mean, I think the reason that it's only registered voters that could vote both times 
is the whole reason to have a straw poll is to convince the legislators that we're serious, that we would actually vote for incorporation if they went to the trouble of introducing it as a bill in the legislature. They don't want to look stupid, you know? They want to, they, if they introduce a bill, they want it to pass. And so if we allowed people who were not voters to vote in the straw poll, well, we might get a very different result when it actually came down to, well, who's in favor of incorporation and that who, who could actually vote. Um, snowbirds, of course, will have uh, a lot of interests. I mean, I was a snowbird. That's probably where a lot of you for several years before we bought here. So we know uh, that people care a lot about the island and maybe have a, a lot of uh, skills that they can offer. And maybe they would want to go for a corporation and maybe they would be against it because they would be against another layer of government, you know. Um, but that's a good point. Okay. Um, yeah. If you had an outside entity do the sort of postcard um, ballot just to get an idea of where we stand, would, would that be considered enough arm's length? Um, because it's going to wait two years for the straw poll before you even get the ball rolling. That's a long time. So the question is that maybe Nadine uh, has the answer to that is, if, are there any uh, uh, organizations that are known to be, uh, that are trusted and that are known to be unbiased? They don't have any, you know, any reason to be swayed one way or the other. We, we at some point discussed the idea of getting um, the, the League of Women Voters involved, but there, were, but we talked about it and that was kind of where it went because we decided not to move forward um, on trying to do our own straw poll. I think we're all a little weary of the idea that um, the straw poll would cause more dissension uh, rather than bringing the community together. And so, again, we really want to take a methodical approach to things and not just jump off the bandwagon and say, hey, we're doing this. I don't think we're there yet. I think we have a lot of questions to answer before any of us really know, um, does it make financial sense for us? Because that's one of the main issues that we need to address. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, a couple back there. And remember, at the end of the meeting, we're gonna have a um, opportunity, and maybe you can even start it around right now. There's going to be an opportunity for you to write down your ideas, your questions, and Cindy will also put two questions up. Um, eh, maybe we'll just read off those questions. But anyway, you don't have to follow the questions. You can just write whatever you want about your ideas, your feelings, your Druthers about um, any of this. Yes, Deb. Yes, uh, the new order here is as a full-time resident. And one of my one of my uh, questions is: Is there a prospectus out there to, to demonstrate the pros and cons of, of being incorporated versus not being incorporated, uh, which could which could be used to market uh, and let people be informed? We we're talking about a lot of the what has to be done thereafter. But, but you need, I, 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 as a new resident here, I've, I've researched a lot, which is online, and I haven't seen anything that, that, that really demonstrates either position. So is there something through the organization, or is this something that can be generated? Yeah. Yes, there's something that can be generated, and we're actually Thank working you. on it. We're working on it, but, but um, part, of the, part of that is, What's it going to cost me and my taxes? And we don't know that until we get the feasibility study done. That's that's the kind of uh, a circle that we end up in. We do have a list of many pros and cons. It's not perfect at this time, but and it also leaves off, you know, one of the central issues that we know people are going to be asking about. Are my taxes going to go up? 
can we even afford this as a community, regardless of whether my taxes go up? You know, we can only find that out through the feasibility study itself, I believe. So, um, so the answer is yes, and, and that list of pros and cons will be essential to any educational campaign that's done uh, before a straw poll was even taken. Because people have to know, well, what should I think about this? I have no idea. I want to know the pros and cons. So, um, okay. My name is Bill Kemp. I'm from St. James City. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's generating everybody's interest in this is we seem to be being treated as second-class citizens by the county. And I think that's the primary thing, to, the primary interest and reason why we're willing to move away from them and escape their, their clutch. But one of the things that we have to understand, if we incorporate as a new city, the new government will be forced to honor anything that the county has already previously approved we will not be able to take some development that's been approved for 2,000 houses and say, wait a minute, you're not going to do that anymore. The county's already approved it, and the new, the new established government is going to have to honor and, and hold fast to what the county's already approved. And it seems to me, and I, I'm assuming everybody in here, that the majority of the problems that we're adhering to with development right now is stuff that has been previously approved by the county when they were seeking rateables back in the 80s and in the 90s and trying to get money to establish to, to, to keep their government running. But if anybody thinks that it's going to stop the development that's already been approved, it isn't going to happen. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I see your logic. Um, I would say that we're, not, we're definitely concerned about those old development orders, but we're also concerned about new things that are being dreamed up right now. Not necessarily by the county. It could be by the city of Cape Coral with their annexations coming closer and closer to Mount Lachey and the whole Pine Island area. So, and then we have the state level. We also have to go along with what, um, what the state decrees that we can, cannot do as a town. And uh, the governor has made it clear that there are some things that we can't um, can't do. So, yeah, go. Uh, is there someone who hasn't spoken yet? I I'll come back to you. Did you want to speak there? Obviously, being concerned about taxes, but would not uh, being incorporated also uh, open up the flow of funds? that an uninput from state level, federal level, various other levels of government where you can apply for grants and so on and so forth, but an unincorporated body would not be able to do it. So where tax and just step back from that, it seems that the best next step is to have a representative from the association that you mentioned come and speak to us. Because they'll be able to answer these questions a little more authoritatively and talk also, I would imagine, about the pros and cons of the corporation uh, as well. But I think that there's a two-sided tax thing here. One is it takes money to run the government. The other thing is it also opens you up to grant money from state, federal, county, and other. Okay, so that's a good point. And also, it was pointed out last time uh, we looked at the corporation, is that Greater Pine Island is a donor community to the rest of Lee County to the tune of a million dollars a year. We pay a million dollars more then we get back in services. So that's where some of the money would come from to run the government of the new town. That right now is not helping us at all. Uh, others, Frank? Um, there's somebody who hasn't spoken. Um, this is, I think, our third meeting, bringing this incorporation back up. Have you, um, since the articles have come out in the Eagle, had any feedback, any email? to the Civic Association? About the no, just about the general feel besides the people coming to the meeting. Yeah, sure. Pro or con or mixed or? I think I've only yeah. seen one oh. con email to me, to the info at GPICA. But I've also had a lot of, yeah, way to go. You know, we really need to uh, do this, but we need to uh, look at it carefully. I like the way you're uh, approaching this, I, you know, we get a variety of 
of uh, feedback from this. There are, there are always some people um, who uh, in no uncertain terms will tell us that we're wrong and this will never work. So, you know, we listen to them too. We listen to everybody. Uh, Frank, did you have another comment? On the website, there's the draft original feasibility plan. So, to some extent, people can take a look at that. It's like 30 pages long or something like that. I didn't put it all out. But I think it'll address some of the questions. But if you understand that it's a draft subject to change, it may help to get people to think about what has already been thought about and what issues and the pros and cons of it. Okay, um, yeah, you can always look at the whole feasibility study. Uh, I, I had, um, I really thought it was such a draft, such a drafty draft that, uh, oh my gosh, um, this is not something that seemed to me to be professionally done and uh, it had a lot of inconsistencies and so I'm not sure how helpful it would be, but there it is on our website. So you can certainly take a look at it. Uh, Helen, there's a question back here. Okay. Hi, I'm David Sapp from, from St. James City. I have okay. formerly lived in one of the five boroughs in New York City that was thinking about seceding and incorporating as its own entity. And part of the problem was that ultimately we needed to have our own police force, fire department, sanitation, etc which costs a lot of money, has that been considered? That's not an issue here because our schools are already taken care of. You already pay taxes for that, that's run separately. We would, typically what towns have done in the past is continue to contract with the county for sheriff's services. Um, you know, Waste Pro, we could start um, contracting with them or be covered under a current contract. I mean, I don't think we had ever envisioned we're going to create a huge government and run all these city services ourselves. That was never an intention that we had discussed. So it, definitely those, those are things we considered, but um, the idea is that we would contract back with the county to provide some of those things, including, um, you know, like parks and rec. Um, but again, state, state DOT, they are still responsible for roads. Lee County cannot force us to take over road maintenance, so that's not an issue. They did so for Stero, which just incorporated within the last 10 years. I can't remember what year they were, but they're a relatively recent community. But that is another question, yeah. I mean, I think, I think they'll try to put it to us. I don't think they'll be happy about us seceding, right? Um, so that's definitely something that, again, we have to look at as we're talking about moving forward or not. Okay, any other questions back here? Okay. Go ahead, Sue. Hi, uh, Sue DeHote from Volkiaia. Um, one of the, I was, I was participant in the last round, um, just as an observer, I wasn't on the board. Um, but one of the things that came out of the, the last attempt at incorporation whatever it's worth, the, the um, consultant analysis on financials came up with it would be it would be feasible to incorporate without raising taxes, uh, given the structure, and this was five or six years ago. Uh, so that was point one, that the financial analysis showed that it was going to be no need to raise taxes in order to incorporate, um, but it was close. So any little hiccups could cause a, a tax increase if it makes something happen. The other thing was that I, I thought it was important is that means there are no increases in services either. So because you incorporate doesn't mean they're going to pay your dirt road. Um, you know, that's, that's just one thing to be aware of is that incorporation, uh, at least the way that the, the last consultant looked at it, would be you get exactly what you have now but under a different government structure. Don't get more, you get what you have now. But you could uh, vote to have more, and then you would vote to fund that as well as if you Correct. were in your that, town. That, then right. those decisions would be local decisions right. in control, controlled by the local governing right. organization. 
So you could do it, but it would be a second step after incorporation. Yeah. So you can hear kind of the pros and cons coming bubbling up right here, right? Okay, Any anyone else? All right, we, I want to encourage you to, uh, to write uh, on these pieces of paper that have been put on your tables um, anything to answer any of these questions. Your thoughts, your questions about incorporation, your ideas, just more generally, how to ensure the future of our islands, whatever that future means to you. And then, you know, any other random questions that you have. Okay, so why, think about that, please, and uh, let us know what you think. So now we're just going to have um, a, a short presentation, uh, I presume, about um, development orders. So this is the development, somebody from the development committee on the board. Hey, so I've taken it upon myself to babysit the island, see what's, uh, see what's uh, trans, you know, switched hands, uh, what type of development is coming through. Well, Thank you. Sorry. And uh, so here's just a quick preview of what's been going on on the island in the last month, month and a half. So real quick, as you can see, we've had a lot of homes actually sell in the last few months and a lot of a lot of land and some of the land is over an acre so you know you, you wouldn't think there's that much activity online selling you know on the island selling but there really is one of the big updates is king's ranch king's ranch used to own uh, a, was it two two hundred and seven acres so they have recently sold the rest of their land they are no longer on the island. It was bought by one individual, and this is the LLC name that they put it under. They're out of Tampa, not locals. So, so some other things I've been watching out for, just you know, joke. Anyway, so on um, July 12th, there was a public meeting that wasn't being held by GPICA, so I did go ahead and attend that. And this particular person bought this lot of land right here. That's, I, I believe that one is the veterinarians, and that's the dollar, dollar store, or the Dollar General. Sorry. East, east side, yeah. Yeah, so there's Stringfellow, and this is Douglas, so I guess that would make that the Sun Trust. Okay. So she plans on making it a fun and funky place to hang out, is what she said, um, or the presenter. The plans are, are doing a shipping container type of venue. She hasn't applied for her permits yet. Uh, this is just the informational meeting that they had on that particular day. She wants to put fresh food. She and ice cream bar with a bar. And just real quick, this is kind of the, what she's looking at. So there's the land, her retaining pond for her water is gonna still be over here. Uh, there's the, oh, there's the dollar. And yeah, in the bottom is SunTrust, thank you. And there's the, the bar area here. She says she had served food out of this side, bathrooms, office, an ice cream bar, and knickknacks. Right here is going to be a live stage also. Uh, she didn't really, or the presenter really didn't go into what's going to be in the brick and mortar behind it. I believe that's actually required by the county to have some brick and mortar there. Um, what was mentioned was um, storage. So, and then some of the paved parking. She wants this to be shell out here and then a four foot fence. Okay, so some of the, the other, oops, other things that are going on is there's gonna be some HEX meetings. What HEX is is a hearing examiner and uh, the X just is, uh, there 
And as you can see, this it used to be the the welcome center for the uh, for yep, Ch Chamber of Commerce, and they sold it. When they sold it, the new property owner went to the county and says, "You know what? Um, I want to change it, and I want it to be used car lot." Currently, there is um, uh, yeah, there's some. Yeah, landscaping, Hunt's landscaping there, but it's only temporary until the property owner chooses to do what they're, they're going to want with it. Um, they're also wanting to expand the bu current building that's already there. The hearing is on October 13th. Um, on the last slide, they'll actually, I'll have a website that you can go to if you're interested in participating on what's required. That's a big, long discussion there. The other hex is coming up is August 31st. This has to do with the Publix. Right behind it, they have this nice big square right here. They are wanting to put uh, EMS possibility, like at an outstation. I think the, the contract went somewhere else, but they wanted that over there. There's talking about reducing the size of the uh, shopping center that they're building over here. They're just, you know, shaving it off by about 7,000 square feet. Seven, yeah, 7,000 square feet. I think it's because they had to put a road back here for safety. Um, in this build, right here, they want to put a self-storage unit. And with that self-storage unit, they want to go above uh, what we allow on our Pine Island plan. So that's going to be at this meeting right here. If, once again, last slide, we'll have a email, well, website that you can go to to learn how to participate in HEX. The people on Pine Island can go to this and discuss and let them know, uh, but it requires participation, and it's usually on a Wednesday in the morning at, I don't know exactly what time, 9 or 9.30 is what they like. Uh, Fort Myers. Of course. Whoops. So one one important thing to know about the hearing examiner meeting. So how zoning works, they have to come before the hearing examiner and then it goes before the county commission after the hearing examiner makes their report. You have to speak before the hearing examiner if you want to speak during um, the county commission meeting. Sorry, Deb, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I wanted to throw that out there so everybody knew that you had to attend the hearing examiner's meeting if you want to say anything to the commissioners about it. So the next meeting that's coming up has to do with this little lot of land right here. This is the feed store that's down on Stringfellow Road. So it's kind of kind of kitty corner. And it's just this one square right here. The property owner is, now I put in currently asking because he's asked for something else and this is what he's, what he changed his mind to. He is changing it from general commercial to commercial plan development, which allows a lot more um, industrial type settings. Uh, where general commercial, they have to kind of, they have to take in the, the rural nature, uh, there's other rules. E each one of these has a different rule setting to them. Now, the, what concerns me is the history, is that on April 2021, the property owner actually went to the county and said, you know what, I wanna make an open air uh, parking storage facility right there. That's because this person had a few uh, citations for uh, leaving containers you know, large container stores, um, boats, trailers, and garbage. Um, so. so this is the address of where the hearings are typically held. And this is the email address if you want to uh, download their forms on how to, you know, what you're allowed to speak about and uh, the order it goes in. But if you do go, I do highly recommend having you write out a written statement uh, when you go, because then you can submit it for, in a sense, evidence or 
because it's a legal proceeding, and that way it'll be considered where possible. If you're not able to make it, um, if you want to email it to GPICA, the board, and one of them will get it to me, and I'll turn it in because I will be attending. Last page, questions. Sure. Yeah. Any questions or, or comments uh, about, about these issues? Okay, so Cindy will come around with a basket and please put your comments, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, it's time for any brief announcements that you might have that you want to let other people know about uh, or anything that you know, you'd like to do or say before we adjourn. Okay. No, you're fine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Uh huh. Water on Harbor Drive, who would know about that? Frank Potter. Frank Potter, of course. He's um, How convenient you're here. <laughs> okay, Frank. I knew I Um the Water Authority has a list of different areas on the island depending on the number of residents there and, and do a scoring. So like the, they did the uh, uh, well, what is, what is it, uh, an area, a couple of different areas, but they're progressively going through that list. Unfortunately, Harbor is pretty low on the list. So uh, I'm not sure, but I, I can tell you that Robert Road, where I live, is even lower than that. So, but. So all those people have to have their own wells? Is that well, right? Robert Road has our own water. We have city water, okay. but in terms of doing any other work. But I was thinking more in terms of fire hydrants, because we don't have any fire hydrants. Okay. Yeah. So do you have well water? Is that how you? Oh, okay. Do they have well water? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nasty, huh? Okay. Oh wow. Well. Uh huh. Oh. Well, you you need to go to the water board. You know the water association. You can walk right into their office, uh, which is right there on Pine Island Road, just as before the gas station, and uh, tell them tell them you're really concerned about this. Raise that issue because we shouldn't have old fashioned. You know, ways of getting drinking water on Pine Island. We should be modernizing, in my opinion, more than, um, yeah, just leaving everything the way it was. All right, any other issues, concerns, announcements? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.